I wonder how anti SJWs are feeling about Dune in the run up to the film. Oh look, geeks and gamers, bad news. Dune goes woke. Yellow Flash 2. Dune trailer has woke Twitter furious. Wants reshoots immediately. Time to cancel Dune. Dune movie goes full woke. Insult Frank Herbert's legacy. I wonder what Denis Villeneuve has to say about the themes of this film. So he said, no matter what you believe, Earth is changing and we will have to adapt. That's why I think Dune, this book, was written in the 20th century. It was a distant portrait of the reality of the oil and the capitalism and exploitation, the over-exploitation of Earth. Today, things are just worse. It's a coming of age story, but it's also a call to action for you. Man, this Dune film sounds very, very woke. I bet conservatives are gonna hate it when they watch it and see all these political themes. Oh, what does Ben Shapiro think of it? Dune is one of the best looking movies ever put on screen. It's well acted and compelling and also pretty much just ends randomly in the middle. Well, I wonder what he has to say on his review watched by hundreds of thousands of people. This may be the best looking science fiction movie ever. And this movie is just spectacular looking. Like from beginning to end, every shot is a piece of art. I think the movie is actually great. He really likes this film. I wonder what Jeremy from Geeks and Gamers thinks of this film. Obviously there was some controversy about a year ago. I covered here on the channel about it potentially going woke. I'm here to tell you that I loved this movie. I was blown away by this movie. I did say that this, I reported this back in 2020. You know, uh, bad news, Dune goes woke. Uh, that did not happen at all. Then I did kind of make a follow up to that and say, wrong, do not going woke. Do not going woke. Do not going woke. Some of you have said in the past, you can't believe how many videos I've made on conservatives not understanding very clear political messaging in their movies especially the people who fight this political culture war every day on basically every single movie. So they will see politics in every movie basically based on the casts like gender, ethnicity. But when it comes to actual political themes in a film like Blade Runner 2049, The Matrix, V for Vendetta, the original Blade Runner, films like Alien and Aliens, films like Star Wars, video games like Bioshock, video games like Metal Gear Solid. I've made videos on all of this, but now we have a new edition. We have Dune, which conservative culture warriors love, but also do not understand how this movie is very political and doesn't agree with their politics, while at the same time, they're slamming Marvel's The Eternals for being way too woke simply for having an openly gay character, a deaf character, and a diverse cast. And I think this goes to show two things, both that conservatives genuinely do not have critical thinking skills when it comes to media, and also woke is basically a dog whistle, basically saying, we don't like this movie because it includes groups we don't like. Because when something that actually is woke about capitalism, about settler colonialism, something Ben Shapiro advocates for in America and Israel, then they seemingly do not understand this messaging despite it being very obvious. So we're gonna talk about all this stuff today. We're gonna be talking about the political messages of Dune, the reviews of these guys, and actually when they were calling Dune woke a year ago based on one of the trailers because of race swapping one of the characters, we're gonna compare it to the Eternals and then just talk about Dune and the political themes of Dune. And while it makes really no sense for people who complain about woke movies all the time to seriously like this movie, I feel like to people like them, it would just confirm a lot of their views on the world that Hollywood is being taken over by the left-wing mob. Before we get any further, I'm gonna plug my socials and Patreon for about one minute, timestamps in the description, so skip forward if you're not interested. Before we get any further, a lot of my work on this channel is demonetized because when you're covering more serious, sometimes edgier topics, YouTube doesn't like this. So if you've ever enjoyed my work, please consider becoming a patron. And you don't have to pledge a crazy amount. I wanna build up my Patreon based on as many people as possible, pledging little amounts, like a dollar or two. So if you, know, you feel like I have ever brought anything that's worthwhile into your life and my content, please really consider becoming a patron to help me continue to do this, regardless of if YouTube monetize or not most of my videos in a given month. Also, if you want to join our communities, come check out our Discord and my subreddit. Those links in the description. And if you want to follow me personally, 
please check out the Cavernacle at Twitter, at Instagram, and also my personal Reddit where you can keep up to date with all my content and what I'm doing. So I have to say, thank you so much for the support lately. I cannot believe we actually hit 50K so quickly. I was thinking the end of the year, but I actually hit it the day after my year anniversary of resigning from my job. And I hit it the week before my 26th birthday. So to celebrate, I usually stream on a Tuesday and a Thursday, but I'm going to stream on Thursday about like midnight my time. So it will technically be my 26th birthday. And we're just going to talk about the channel and everything like that. My girlfriend, Holly, will join me too. And I want to answer questions. If you've got any questions you've been dying to ask me, in the comments, put question in all caps before your comment, and I'll probably read it out at some point on the stream. Now, the moment you've all been waiting for, white chocolate orange is back in stock in the UK. Last Christmas, we had a couple. There you go, nice and in focus there. By the way, these aren't actually oranges coated in chocolate. It's like chocolate flavored orange shaped like an orange. There we go, what a lovely moment. Look at this pyramid now. Look how far we've grown. Some of you would have seen it like so small. Some of you might have just came recently. I've had like, you know, nearly 6,000 new subscribers in the last month. But yeah, just wanted to say thanks so much for the support and let's just keep going. Let's see how far we can go before the end of 2021. So before I play you a bit more of the anti SJWs and Ben Shapiro's Dune review, basically to sum it all up, these guys were getting really, really mad last year when one of the characters who was in Dune was changed and was now played by a black woman. But these guys were very mad about it. They were saying that Dune has gone woke. Dune has gone woke makes me laugh. Just the sentiment that this film has gone woke simply for changing the race of one of the characters, not because of the anti-colonialism in it. it. Never cease to amaze me, but check this out here. It doesn't sound very promising at all. All and this is par for the course in Hollywood. So again, if I mispronounce words or any of these characters' names, I apologize in advance. Let's get into the article right now. Sharon Duncan Brewster confirmed as race and gender swapped uh, Luet Kine in Dune film. Plus other heavy indicators, film will be woke. The upcoming Dune film will feature a race and gender swapped uh, kindness with Sharon Duncan Brewster playing the character. Not only will the character feature this race and gender swap, but comments from the cast and director indicate the film will be woke. That's just not good, ladies and gentlemen. That is not good at all. And if you want to race swap a character, again, while I think that's a terrible decision and that's purely SJW, I personally would not have known about it if it wouldn't have been reported because I have no knowledge of it. But when Denny Villeneuve is sitting there talking about capitalism bad and all of these horrible things and how women are the greatest creatures to ever, you know, be on earth and all like it's just this this sounds really like it's going in the wrong direction. And that's disappointing because up to this point, Villeneuve has done a great job. Do not going woke, not going woke, not going woke. But isn't that amazing? They love Dune. Now they've seen it. They were complaining that it was woke before simply because one of the characters had their race changed. That's woke. Anti-colonialism, that's not woke though. So we're going to get into like spoiler territory. I'm trying not to spoil the whole film in case some of you want to watch this and you have like a maybe like passing interest in this movie. So I'm not going to spoil it like some idiots did on Twitter for me. But I want to talk about my opinion on Dune, and then we're going to get into Ben Shapiro's opinions and Jeremy from Geeks and Gamers. Basically, I didn't know anything about this movie beyond, like, the sort of politics being, like, anti-colonialism and, obviously, the David Lynch movie, which I've never seen. So, by and large, I didn't really know the story of this movie. So I go in, I watch it, and I really like this movie. You know, I got Blade Runner 2049 posters up there, which you guys would have seen in the streams. So that's my favourite movie. Uh, Denis Villeneuve isn't like my favorite director or anything, so I haven't liked all his movies. But yeah, very overwhelming. Just looked beautiful. I just love how like tactile, I guess the word is, that he takes time to make people interact with the environment. The sets are just so nice to look at. You really feel like this world could be real. And I do like how this has kind of gone out of its way to make sci-fi a bit weird again. Like when you see the empires like guards when they're coming down uh, to tell House of Trades they have to go to Arrakis and take over the spice trade and stuff like that. They just look proper weird. And the Harkonnens guy played by Stellan Skarsgård, like being like this weird worm thing looks super weird. 
yeah, sci-fi has gotten weird again. Even their little helicopter things that look like dragonflies and stuff. But overall, yeah, really, really liked it. What stood out to me as someone who loves my politics, loves political analysis of films, was the politics of it. Again, I hadn't read about this. I hadn't read about the like drama around it, if there is even any drama around it. But basically, a couple things stood out to me. So one big scene, you have Paul walking in the garden in Arrakis in like the sort of like colonial mansion thing in Arrakis and there are palm trees and he says I didn't know these grew on Arrakis the guy who's tending them says they don't grow here but to keep them alive we have to water them with enough water that would basically keep five men going for one day and Paul you know he's like this more naive character says well why don't we just get rid of them and the guy's saying no and obviously that's just like a message about colonialism if you know anything about colonialism you know about like colonial gardens where they bring like their foreign plants spend loads of water watering these green places in very very hot climates in the middle east or in india and places like that so a nice like callback to that stuff as well now we were talking about kinds as well and her character is interesting because she's part of both worlds but she describes when they go to this like kind of like water refinery she's like arrakis could have been a paradise because we were developing the technology to make water very available then they discovered spice, and spice can only exist in this like hot climate, so no one invested in this water technology anymore. It was more profitable to keep the climate really, really hostile so we can extract like the mineral wealth from Arrakis. Of course, you can compare that to loads of colonial episodes, you know, European colonialism. Throughout history, it's like very apparent this is the symbolism going on here. You know, you could compare it to like the climate of conflict in the Middle East, which allows western oil companies to go in and you know extract the wealth from there of course this isn't even like a modern thing european colonialism in africa has been massive for this type of thing keeping poverty rife you see that a lot with the imf and world bank privatizing economies the west jumping into bed with dictators who purposely make these countries bad so the west can extract profit from it so very on the nose and of course you even have like the racial divide in that house of trades and people like that really are just like stand-ins for European colonialists because even the people who aren't like pale white skinned, they are like Mediterranean essentially, most of them anyway. So Oscar Isaac is like Latino, for example, whereas the Fremen are mostly black or Middle Eastern and you have Javier Bardem who's Mediterranean because he's Spanish, but in his outfit, he can easily pass for someone who is Middle Eastern as well. And then the Islamic influence is so apparent, they call Paul the Mahdi. And the Mahdi has significance in Britain in that this movement in Sudan in the 1880s, an anti-colonial movement against the British and also their Egyptian colonial troops fighting them, were fighting for their Mahdi, which we're gonna get into a bit later, but in certain sects of Islam is a very significant figure, like a prophet, and a famous general called General Gordon died fighting the Sudanese. So this word specifically has become part of the fabric of British colonialism. Not to mention the outfits and the chanting are really like references to various Islamic cultures. I find it quite problematic in a few ways because of like Orientalists. But generally, you're watching this film and the anti-colonialism is very, very apparent. You're meant to side with the Fremen and even people like Leto, played by Oscar Isaacs, seen as more like a tolerant ruler, he's still a colonialist. Like he still wants to use the Fremen for his own power. He still wants to use Spice for his own power. He doesn't really have their best interests at heart. He's just not like a total monster where, you know, you see later the Selen Skarsgård character saying just, you know, kill all the Fremen. Oscar Isaac's character will not do that. But the general point and Javier Bardem's reception to him is they're still colonialists. They still shouldn't be there. They're still exploiting the Fremen. It's just in a different way. I actually have like an 80 year occupation of that. I wonder what images that conjures up in my mind. I don't think Ben Shapiro would like the comparison I would make that even you could maybe draw parallels between Dune and Israel Palestine. So if you're a political person like I am, like Ben Shapiro is, like Geeks and Gamers is, and they're fighting the culture war for the right, and I'm just analyzing these films in a political way, and I'm giving credit where credit is due, but we're gonna get into my criticisms a bit later, you'd think they'd pick up on these things. But here you go, I'm gonna play both of these reviews for you. I'm gonna cut them up, but trust me, and you can go watch them yourself and see if I'm lying, they do not mention politics really. I'm gonna get into the politics they do mention. Ben Shapiro seems to have taken review training from The Guardian in that his review is essentially just saying what happens in the film. 
with tiny little points. This may be the best looking science fiction movie ever. And this movie is just spectacular looking. Like from beginning to end, every shot is a piece of art. The color scheme is wonderful. Every shot is beautifully constructed. The special effects are great. You see every dollar on this. The acting is excellent across the board. The score is overwrought. I like Hans Zimmer, but Hans Zimmer basically just takes the Blade Runner 2049 score and just plops it right in the center with very high-pitched singing and some throat singing. I think that the score is overdone because the movie is so weighty that you don't actually need to make the, the movie weightier by use of the score. I mean, it's a very dark movie. Just visually, it's dark, but it is also, the story is, is very dark. On the other side, you have House Harkonnen, which is kind of a stand-in for the Soviets, kind of. The idea here is that House Harkonnen is going to attack. The Empire is going to quietly support House Harkonnen and the Atreides are going to go down. I think the movie is actually great. I think it's going to be hard to adjudicate whether the movie is is great actually until you get a second part because you don't know what the conclusion of the movie looks like. It could be a complete disaster area, in which case the first half is great and the second half sucks. But if this completes in the way that the first half is done, I think it's going to be one of the great sci-fi epics of all time. So the only politics there Ben Shapiro brings up is that the Harkness somehow are the Soviet Union. So he's clearly looking at this film in a political way, but he misses the anti-colonialism and he misses the anti-capitalism and he just kind of makes a weird comparison about it being the Soviet Union. I really don't understand the comparison between the Soviet Union, even if the book made that comparison, I'm not sure if it does. I don't see the iconography of the Soviet Union. I don't know about like a Soviet 80 year occupation. And just like one more little nitpick, Ben Shapiro is like, isn't he like trained as a musician? I don't know how he thinks Dune's soundtrack is like Blade Runner 2049's ramped up. As someone who like listens to the Blade Runner 2049 soundtrack when I edit quite a lot, I can tell you they're nothing alike. The only tracks that are kind of similar is I think they both have like Mongolian throat singing or something in one of the tracks in both films. But Blade Runner is way more like gentle and like ambient. It has like way more like lighter songs, for example, in, like the balcony scene between Kay and Joy or in the snow scene at the end of the film with Kay talking with Deckard, or even just Kay chilling in the LEPD building with Joy going through the archives. Like you're probably not gonna stick on the Dune soundtrack to relax where you can easily do that with the Blade Runner soundtrack. I only bring this up because Ben Shapiro also loves Blade Runner and he said in like 2017, it was one of his favorite films. Again, how's that for irony? Another film about like anti-capitalism is about global warming and climate change. And somehow he thinks it's like a non-political masterpiece. But now we're gonna get to Jeremy from Geeks and Gamers Review, and he was actually worried about it going woke, and he's happy to report this film didn't go woke. Obviously, there was some controversy about a year ago I covered here on the channel about it potentially going woke. I'm here to tell you that I loved this movie. I was blown away by this movie. From the moment it begins until the moment it ended, I was completely immersed in this world. This guy is a fantastic director, and every single shot in this movie is meant to make you feel like you are part of something grand, something epic, which is a word I don't like to use because it gets overused. Epic is the exact way to describe Dune, especially in IMAX. I did say that this, I reported this back in 2020, you know, uh, bad news, Dune goes woke. Uh, that did not happen at all. Then I did kind of make a follow-up to that and say, wrong, Dune not going woke. Um, this movie was awesome. This movie was absolutely awesome. Now, I got one question about this that I want people to answer me in the comments. Do you think he actually saw this movie? Most of the things he lists are very, very generic. And I could have probably said that without seeing the movie. Let's say these guys who love their pop culture, they did see the movie. Don't you think that's insane that they both think this movie isn't woke or isn't political? And someone as political as Ben Shapiro, someone like Jerry for Geeks and Gamers, who politicizes everything in media, somehow don't have criticisms about the films like left-wing anti-colonial, anti-capitalist message. Not only that, Jeremy thought this film was woke for race swapping a character, but not woke for actually woke messaging. Now you guys who've watched my other videos, you know I have theories about these guys. I genuinely think with conservatism, you have to have a lack of critical thinking to be a conservative because you're upholding a status quo that largely doesn't benefit you. And to accept it, you have to like kind of turn your brain off. So I think when it comes to media, conservatives really only see films as like an A to B narrative. So when you're watching Dune, you're watching A to B, you're watching Paul's hero's journey and all the subtext doesn't matter. 
and the subtext isn't even worth analyzing. I think a lot of people maybe don't even like pay attention properly when they watch films because how you can miss the woke messaging of Dune and say it's not woke when you're a culture war warrior who says everything is woke just blows my mind. Same with Ben Shapiro as well. Now I tweeted about this and there's one other theory. These guys knew Dune would be very popular just like Blade Runner so they actually just agree with the majority opinion to seem cool. I believe that in Ben Shapiro's case as someone who is like very like not cool. But in terms of Jeremy, I don't think he's cool either. But he doesn't mind having like more like hot takes on stuff and saying like, he says he hates the Zack Snyder movies, for example, even though he was like pushing for this Snyder Cut stuff. But I don't know, again, let me know in the comments if you think these guys actually watch the movie or even like the movie. So before we get even further into the politics of Dune and my own criticisms of the representation of like Middle Eastern people in the film, I want to quickly turn to Marvel's The Eternals. So Marvel's The Eternals is a movie I love making fun of because I'm just sick of Marvel movies at this point. I love what Ridley Scott recently said about Marvel movies along with Denis Villeneuve and Martin Scorsese. This just like fills my heart with joy because these guys are so talented. Like Martin Scorsese and Ridley Scott are like the godfathers of like modern film and they hate Marvel movies. So that's nice to see. But for enjoying memeing about like Kingo and just how bad this film looks, Obviously, I don't hate the film for representation, like, you know, having an Asian woman, Chloe Zhao is directing it, you have an openly gay character in a gay relationship, you have a deaf character, and you have, like, a visibly very diverse cast, which makes sense for these characters that are meant to be, like, these immortal gods and stuff like that. So that's all, like, the nice parts of the Eternals, and I credit them for doing that, and they even wouldn't play the film in countries that have laws against things like being gay and stuff like that. So credit to that. But safe to say, not many Marvel films are overtly political. I guess like Captain America, The Winter Soldier is one of the more political ones. Maybe like Falcon and the Winter Soldier does have a political element to it, even though I think it's like this weird liberal politics. But safe to say, most Marvel films don't really have much politics in them. And if they do, it's way in the background. Like it's subtext that is just so below the surface where the subtext in Dune is actually part of the plot. But these guys said the Eternals was woke and was so bad for like left-wing woke politics simply because of its diversity. They're so just gonna play you some clips quick. Now you've got a Marvel actor trashing the fans and what happened? He had to delete his tweet because the fans continued to speak up. So yes, I will continue to complain. We will continue to complain until there's nothing to complain about. There's always going to be something to complain about from a critical standpoint, but when you're talking about identity politics and our entertainment being ruined by these egotistical Hollywood nutjobs, yes, I will continue to call them out because they deserve to be called out. And if you can't respect that source material, then the fans are going to call you out. That doesn't make the fans wrong. It doesn't make the fans toxic. It means that the fans should be listened to. You have a left-wing mindset. That's what's wrong with you. And that's what we're so tired of. We're so tired of this left-wing mindset where it's okay to attack fans that have a difference of opinion or a different political opinion or a different worldview, all because you live in that bubble. So there's nothing wrong with people being gay. I don't care about that and most normal people don't care about that. It's the virtue signaling, it's the pandering, it's the fact that this Eternals cast and the crew have done everything in their power to pander and virtue signal around the identity of the characters. They can't stop telling you about how important this is in all of their uh, red carpet premiere or interviews and all of that. They can't stop saying, the most ridiculous things. Go watch Gary from Nerdrotic's latest video on Eternals. It's a fantastic video, as all Gary's videos are, but he's got clips of all of these interviews where they just can't stop saying diversity, inclusion, representation. This movie's gonna save lives. This movie's gonna be the most important movie of all time. That's what people are tired of. It's not that there's a gay character in the movie. It's the fact that they cannot stop using the sexuality, using the race, using gender, using sexual orientation, all of this stuff, for their virtue signaling points. That's what people are tired of. You could just get an AI to become these guys because they say the same thing for every movie. But that just shows you in stark contrast that woke is becoming a dog whistle for just saying, we hate minorities and other groups we don't like and we don't want to see them on our screen. Because if you seriously think more representation in Marvel movies is left-wing politics, 
but Dune isn't woke at all. Then like I said at the start, that says so much about your politics and says so much about your critical thinking skills. So that's the fun hypocrisy out the way. So now I wanna delve a bit deeper into the politics of Dune. Talk about it already, we have references to the Mahdi and we also clearly in Dune see these Fremen people inspired by the Bedouin, nomads in the Middle East who of course travel the desert and are really experienced traveling the desert, really know how to survive in the desert. So what my problem is generally, and we're gonna get back to this a bit later, is through an Orientalist like mindset is that the Fremen are essentially space Muslims and every kind of culture and stereotype is basically jammed into one. So there isn't really a positive like nuanced portrayal of Muslim peoples in mainstream Hollywood. It's getting a bit better. There are shows like Rami, there are Iranian films that deal with this stuff and just show Muslim peoples as normal people. But I have wrote a whole article on Medium about Orientalism in the last like 15 years with Hollywood movies depicting Muslims and how they're often either evil caricatures or they're onlookers to war with white countries like America and the UK and seem quite ambivalent to the suffering of those soldiers, making them look quite evil or even complicit in what's happening. And of course, Edward Said wrote the work that inspired this sort of thinking Orientalism itself. But to give some credit, I wanted to talk about Muslims who think that Dune is like a good depiction of Muslims and they like it and stuff. So the religious news service. So Amir Hussein, a cultural critic and professor of theological studies. He said, as a kid growing up in the 70s, he was personally drawn to Dune's Islamic themes. You have to understand there weren't Muslim ideas and storylines on television or in movies. Then there was this book of science fiction that for myself as a Muslim minority, I was able to see my culture, Islamic culture, as one of the sources for inspiration and being represented in a positive way. The Fremen referred to Paul Atreides as the Mahdi or expected one, though not mentioned in the Quran, the Mahdi in Islamic tradition is a figure and spiritual redeemer who many Muslims believe will unite the world before the return of Jesus at the end times. However, the Mahdi role and identity differ slightly in Shia beliefs and also appears in the Baha'i tradition. Trades also takes the name Muhadib in the novel nearly identical to the Arabic word for teacher. This again hints at the Sufi influence on the views of religion held by the Fremen in the book. Though they are described as following the Zen Sunni faith in the novels, an amalgamation of Zen Buddhism and Sunni Islam. The plot itself recalls the ideas of Islamic philosopher Ibn Khaldun, whose work stressed the cyclical nature of government in North Africa, where decadent ruling regimes were overthrown at regular intervals by tribal groups. Over time, these new ruling regimes would reflect the depravity of the regime they had displaced, sowing the seeds of future rebellion. In the novel, a similar cycle plays out. Even the good guys and their successor regimes do not live up to the ideals. Herbert gives a direct nod to Ibn Khaldun in the books when he names the Fremen's religious text after one of his own works. So I thought first I'd show how Dune is inspired by Islam. So again, another point why Ben Shapiro should probably hate this movie because he doesn't like Islam too much. He likes fear mongering about Islam all the time. He hates Muslim Palestinians as well. You think a Zionist who's pro settler colonialism and a film which is about Arab and Muslim resistance to European colonialism and dictatorships would hate this movie. I am a political animal, Herbert said in 1983, and I never really left journalism. I am writing about the current scene, the metaphors are there. Dune was written during the height of decolonization in the Muslim world. His story reflects this at times in obvious ways. In the book, the Fremen cheer out and chant for Paul their Mahdi. His mother tells the readers that this means long live the fighters. Jessica's translations are mostly correct. The phrase in Arabic for long live the martyrs, and this was chanted by Algerians. When Bena Yusuf Ben Kedda, one of the leaders of the Algerian War of Independence and the head of its first government, arrived in Algiers after gaining independence from France. Not only is this scene reminiscent of Dune, but Herbert even kept the French spelling and translation directly in his own narrative. His story might have taken place thousands of years into the future, but it was intentionally calling to current events. Even the name Paul takes on, Muhadib, reflects the period of history. On Arrakis, it refers to a kangaroo mouse, but in the explanation of its meaning provided by Stilgar, he says it also means instructor of boys, a definition Herbert probably pulled from the glossary of Richard Francis Burton's translation of 1001 Nights, but Herbert's Muadib was also likely inspired by the first president of Mali after its independence from France, Modipo Keita, Kata, a descendant of Malian aristocracy, was depicted in a 1961 article in the New York Times as the only spokesperson for, Afri for the African community tall enough to look present the ghoul in the eye. 
He was an ideal symbol for Frank Herbert, a man from the desert facing a colonial empire in the eyes. Cater, as a member of the UN, was an advocate for pan-African unity and the non-aligned movement and Algerian independence. Part of the reason for Herbert's clear Orientalism was simply that he was a product of his time. Most English and French literature about Islam and desert cultures at the time was Orientalist. To his credit, Herbert tried to complicate this as much as he could. Language was the primary tool he used to do this. Spoken language, because in his own words, we are mostly profoundly conditioned to language as speech. So people have criticized Dune as like a white savior narrative. And I think that's like a fine criticism for the first movie. Like I said, I haven't read the books, but people have told me that the whole thing is kind of like a spin on like the white savior narrative with the Fremen and you know the Atreides and everything don't come out of the whole thing looking that good but generally like it's a very interesting construct and it's very of its time like it comes out of the 1960s anti-colonial movement between 1960 and about like 1971 and 2 so many middle eastern and african nations gained their independence from the french and the british there were so many historic african and middle eastern leaders finally standing up to this colonialism many were of course killed in places like Congo. But even my problems with the film itself and the Orientalism, you can see that, you know, some Muslims who grew up on Dune, they said they liked it because it's the first positive portrayal of Muslims in Western media. And I can see how that goes a long way for people. But generally with the climate of Hollywood, when we don't get too many like positive portrayals of Muslims, and you're just gonna basically put Muslim culture, Arab culture into a blender and create the Fremen on screen, I can understand why people would say that's Orientalist because you're just taking stuff that we as the Western audience kind of know, but we don't really understand. And you're basically showing us a mirror of how we actually view Muslim peoples in the West. Like we don't have nuance, we don't understand them. So you put like the Bendouin, you put like Mahdi believers from maybe like Sudan or other parts of the, you know, Africa and the Middle East and you blend them together and you know, we don't know the difference. But generally, yeah, I really, really like the film, but I'm never gonna stop finding it hilarious. And I hope you guys find it hilarious too, now that you know the context a bit more of these films. That Ben Shapiro, someone who went to Harvard, someone whose whole life is politics, someone who gives lectures on politics, someone who makes videos on so much stuff, cultural stuff, Sesame Street, movies, and everything like that. Ben Shapiro sat for that movie, he saw the references to like the Mahdi, obviously these prominent you know, figures throughout Islamic history and in certain Islamic belief systems. You saw the clear, clear parallels between the Fremen and you know, various non-white anti-colonial struggles in the last, like I don't know, 70, 80 years. You saw the houses with clear stand-ins for European colonialists. And the only political take you had is that the Harkness who were like the main baddies were the Soviet Union. That's the only takeaway you had. And I also find it funny he likes this movie so much because again, it holds a mirror up and says, settler colonialism is bad. Settler colonialism in the Middle East is bad. Settler colonialism in America is bad. Something that Ben Shapiro always advocates for. So culture war warriors looking for the next scandal of a movie going woke completely miss a movie that basically holds up their belief system to their face, says it's wrong, and Ben Shapiro, like I said, his only take is Soviet Union ban. Now with the Jeremy twins, like the Quarter and Geeks and Gamers, it's just clear how much woke has become a dog whistle. Also how stupid they are as well, along with Ben Shapiro. They can sit through this movie and say it's non-woke and there's no politics in it. Don't worry, everyone. Don't worry, all my insane fans. This movie isn't woke. Go enjoy it. I mean, it's probably a good thing, so hopefully some people will take away the anti-colonial messaging. Meanwhile, The Eternals is woke left-wing garbage because it has a deaf character and it also has a couple non-white characters and it also has a gay relationship. So diversity, very, very woke communist, anti-colonialism inspired by Muslim resistance movements to European colonialism and African resistance movements to European colonialism, not political. Anyway, let me know what you guys think in the comments. Did you have any criticism of Dune? I've had some of my Muslim subscribers reach out to me and we've had a discussion about this stuff as well. They kind of agree with my points on Orientalism, but interesting to see what you think. Again, if you want a question in the Q&A, please write question and then write your question and hopefully we'll get to that on Thursday night. Thanks again so much for the 50K. It really, really means a lot to me, especially like I said, 
After a whole year of doing this full time and quitting my old awful job, which I spoke about in my anti-work video and a whole video I made just when I quit. It's really nice to feel like I can do this full time and there is like a future with it. But anyway, follow me on social media at The Cavernacle on Twitter and Instagram. If you want to join our communities, check out our Discord and my subreddit. And if you want to support my work, check out my Patreon. And if you made it this far, thank you for watching.